welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. A beautiful day in the nation's capital, even if it is going to get quite chilly later. We're recording this on Tuesday, December the 10th as warm in the morning, cold in the evening, winter is here, everyone's getting ready for the end of the year as we look forward to turning the calendar to 2020. But before we do that, we are here to talk about another great documentary that I was fortunate enough to get to watch before the interview that we conducted today. It's, It's been a fun run of historical documentaries, historical films that we've had this fall and been able to talk about on the show. Another really good one today. The title of the film is Golda, and it is premiering in January, starting on January the 3rd at the Hot Docs Ted Rogers Cinema. It's starting its theatrical run there in Toronto. And as you might guess from the title, Golda, it is about Golda Meir, the Israeli Prime Minister from 1969 to 1974. This is a figure who I was not overly familiar with before watching this film. And, you know, in the interview in the episode today, we talk about the perception of Golda Meir. Certainly in the West, when she's brought up, it's generally with a lot of admiration and it's in a positive light. But At home in Israel, her legacy is quite different. And this film starts to address part of why that is and really delves into the two different camps that exist in assessing Golda Meir's legacy. And and it's a film that is put together really cleverly, I thought. It's it's has a lot of the traditional documentary tenets of talking heads and archival footage, but it walks a, a fine line of presenting the two different sides without trying, at least to me, uh, of having too strong of its own perspective. It really lets the people in the film speak for themselves. And it has a really interesting through line that they found in the Israeli archives a film or, or a video of a television interview that no one knew about. So it's a clip where... She's on a TV show. This is after her time as prime minister. And she's on the show, but they keep the cameras running after the show. So it's her and the other two people, and they're just talking. And they ask her some questions. She offers what feels like some very unfiltered thoughts Uh, on multiple occasions. She says, well, we're not on the air anymore. You're not going to run this. Here's what I think. And her thoughts in that segment or not even say that post-show discussion, is really what makes up the through line of this film. Really cleverly done, and it's established in the first couple minutes of, of the film, and that sort of takes you through it. And it's a, a fascinating thing. It's especially fascinating because she is smoking the entire time. Uh, the one thing I, about Golda Meir that I think I knew before, but it was certainly cemented in this film, that she enjoyed her cigarettes and uh, was known to uh, even smoke them when she was getting cancer treatments. Uh, so she was uh, definitely all in on the cigarettes uh, during her life. Uh, but th- that, but the film uses that clip to take us through her life and career, really cleverly done. And I was fortunate enough earlier today to have the opportunity to talk to Udi Nier, who was one of the directors of the film. I spoke to him. He's in Tel Aviv. He, as we spoke, he was in a... Uh, a newsroom, a very active newsroom. You'll probably be able to hear that on this show. Uh, I don't think it really interrupted the flow of the discussion at all, uh, but you just might hear that on his end, that, that he's in a very active space. So uh, without any further ado, here is my conversation with Udi Nier, one of the directors of Golda. Udi Nier, uh, on the phone from Tel Aviv. Uh, how are you today? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for taking the time to talk about uh, Golda, the film. It's uh, I watched it last night, as I said off the top. Very lovely uh, film. Uh, I'm curious, though, th- this is an interesting story because 
Golda Meir is somebody who certainly every thing that I've read or seen about her, which hasn't been a lot, to be fair, here in Canada, has mm -hmm. been overall pretty positive that she was a, a good prime minister, that people in Israel liked her. Uh, but the movie starts by basically pointing out that it's a more contested legacy than that. Uh, so, so I'm curious, you know, in Israel, is she a figure that is still discussed a lot? And is that contentious legacy of hers something that is a, a prominent or gets discussed frequently when we're talking about Israeli history? Um, I don't know to say if it's... Um... If it's discussed frequently, it's still a, a prime minister that has been um, out of office and, and passed away over 40 years ago. But um, but it is very clear that whenever she is discussed in Israel, almost almost um, always, it's in a very negative context. Uh, when we started this project a couple of years ago, there was um, it was just around the 70th anniversary of Israel, and um, there were several uh, surveys done either. Um, with professionals, historians, and so on, or with the general public, uh, ranking the different Israeli prime ministers over the years, and uh, Golda ranked second from last only to Bibi. <laughs> oh wow! Um, so yeah, so her reputation is definitely very, very bad, and she's remembered in a very negative context in Israel. And the the movie gets into a lot of the the reasons why, uh, but I, I'm curious just about the the through line of how you went about putting this together because you know right off the top you see this this unaired interview with her and that's that serves as a through line uh, through the film which is quite interesting but you also went and found people who had really diverse views of her and what her career entailed during her time as prime minister so so what was that process like in in signing people up and, and getting access to all this archival film as well as the interviews that you set up well um it was actually done the other way around so we started okay. with interviewing people um we didn't know anything about this lost tape or the the lost interview segment um we started with a, a very uh standard, I would say, documentary, interviewing people uh, who knew her and worked with her. We knew right from the get-go that we don't want um, experts and historians, but people who actually were in the room and can give us a first uh, first witness account of, of what happened. Um, and that's how we started. So uh, most people, of course, were talking about the late 60s, early 70s. Most most people who were alive and, and active back then are pretty old at the moment. Um, so we started with interviewing the oldest ones um, and and then moved on to other parts of the story and only after about two years of work um, when the film was almost completely done um, we found this lost tape in the Israeli wow. archive which is a fascinating and crazy place where <laughs> there are there's a lot of mess, but also a lot of treasures to be found. Um, and this tape was lying around in a box in the Israeli TV archives for 40 years. We got a call saying that um, as part of our research, they knew that we're looking for gold materials. And they gave us a call and said, uh, listen, there's a box here, a cart an old carton box that was lying around on the floor in one of the warehouses. It says gold and nobody knows what's inside. Um, and it's unlogged and it's on a format that we can't read anymore. We don't have the machinery here because it's so old. Um, wow. And we took that old umatic tape and converted it um, in an external studio. And when it came back, um, we opened the, the computer, the file, and, and it was clear to us that the film has to uh, basically be redone <laughs> uh, in a completely different way because um, this material was, was priceless and sort of the, the documentary miracle that you always hope for when you – work on a historical story um yes. so that really changed it and to answer your question on on uh, the difference in views with the interviewees i think right from the beginning we knew that when we talk about golda um there'll be people who are um, everyone we'll talk to will either be very much for her or very much against her but they will all be very um devoted to one of these two positions um and we knew that this tension um between how she's perceived mostly between how she's perceived in the world and in israel but also in the way that it reflects in different views of of the people around her within israel um we knew that we that this tension between um her supporters and her opponents was the tension that we want to um, bring to the center of the film. Um, and so we chose interviewees uh, and tried to keep it as balanced as we could. 
and, and sort of intercut them also in the editing to make sure that we keep this tension alive throughout the film and don't get one narrative, but in a way, two narratives or two opinions or on, on each of the stories that we covered in the film. And how do you navigate that as you're putting that together in, in the editing room? Because for a lot of the film, as I was watching it, I, I was trying to think to myself, what perspective is the is the film taking? Like, like what what's their point of view? And I like like you as the directors and the people putting it together. And for most of it, maybe even through all of it, I I, I couldn't I couldn't figure it out. Like I didn't know where you stood, uh, and that you really did walk that fine line of giving equal voice to to both sides. But over the course of an 88 minute film, right, that's a difficult thing to do. So how did you navigate that in the in the editing room? Um, there's a couple of things to that. First, I, I have to say one of the most interesting things is um, I, I, I sort of take it as a compliment that, that that's what you saw in the film because that's what we were aiming for. But one of the most interesting things is that in Israel, um, the reactions following the, the screenings of the film were um, more or less unanimous that the film was very forgiving towards Golda, um, that, that it really sort of took her stand or her side in the story um and when we started screening it in in the u.s in doc nyc and and in jewish film festivals and so on the the reaction was the complete opposite so the first reactions we got were <laughs> why is this film attacking golda so so much um and i think we tried to sort of go in somewhere in the middle not because we don't have a stand we think what we think about golda but when we guess we get asked a lot in, in q and a's uh, after screenings, if um, if we are for or against Golda and what did we want to be in the film. And we always say that uh, we didn't want to be for her or against her. We just wanted to sort of um, <laughs> walk on her side in a way, mm. um, to just see things through her eyes. And I think the, the, the biggest thing that we used to create this balance is um, – there are two elements to this film. One is the more historical um, context of it, I would say. So the historical story that the film is, is layered with a lot of details of what actually happened, um, regardless of what she's going through. Uh, so the context she's, she's operating within. And, um, and that voice, I would say, is closest to ours. So it, it analyzes the reality, the historical story from our point of view, and, and sometimes we say quite um, strict or quite um, unforgiving things towards her or her choices um, and their consequences. But on the other hand, we, we really uh, were sure to, to uh, maintain another layer throughout the film, which is her more personal angle of things. Um, so mm -hmm. to constantly go back to her uh, while this is happening in Israel or in the region, what is she going through? Um, how is this big war that we all know the details of or we're now listening to the details of? What was it like for her um, on the day to day personal level? Um, and we used her autobiography to quote some of her um, her own account of, of the events um, on a more emotional level, and we also used some of the interviewees and some of the other materials that we had to maintain that um, that narrative throughout the film. So there's always, I think, a clash between what happened, which can be quite strict towards her, um, and how she saw things, which is always a more empathic um, side of things. Yeah, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is that so often political figures, especially at wartime political figures, we tend to forget that they're human beings too, and we focus on them as the decision makers and, and what they do. And this is a, a film that it's, it's not just about what she's doing, what she's deciding to do, but it does kind of humanize her and sets, sets her in context of a woman in her 70s. Her sister is sick. She's sick. She's tired, and she openly talks about that. And it, it really makes her so much more in the film than just... A political figure it really shows her as a human being which I could, is I could see why people who don't agree with a lot of the decisions she made that they would take from this film that you're being very defensive of her or, or almost saying that what she did was good and I, I could see why they would come to that conclusion given to that conclusion that, to, yeah. to that humanizing way that you present the film but that's almost what I, I would assume as a filmmaker what you kind of want to do with almost anybody is present them as a human being right 
Yeah, and I have to say that uh, for me personally, the the biggest challenge in working on this film was connecting to the character. <laughs> um, right. I did. I didn't start this film. Um, neither hating or loving Golda. It's, I, I don't think of prime ministers in, the, in these terms, but um, but I did start it with a very um, I would say negative opinion on on her views, and I, I still feel that way in a way. So it's it, I, I still disagree with her politics. I disagree with her world views. I think that the choices she made were um, wrong for the time and and had very grave consequences in many cases. But on the other hand, and that's the process I went through throughout the the uh, time we worked on the film and the, in a way that's the process we eventually try to create for the viewer as well is is exactly what you're talking about to to empathize with her and to to see the more human side of it uh, because I think unlike uh, especially unlike leaders of today <laughs> especially in Israel but also in other places I think she was very genuine and for me that was very refreshing to see I think that's when I started to change my views on her or to empathize with her a little bit is when I realized that she's not lying to me she's not playing with me she's not um, I can disagree s severely with what she's saying but I believe that this is what she believes uh, rather than spinning spinning me off with a um, you know with some kind of story so um so that was the point where we started to change our, our um, view of her. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and like there's a couple anecdotes in the film that, that really highlight that too. There's the one that I really enjoyed about they're in a meeting with all men and her and the fan <laughs> started to, wasn't working right and she let every man try to figure it out and then she actually figured it out so like like those little things yeah. that that go beyond politics it's just sort of situate her as a as a human being and sort of what her approach to different things were is is quite fascinating uh, but that also led me to think about uh, Golda Meir as a figure in the Middle East at this time as a woman and you know, some of the challenges yeah. and it's mentioned in the film that that she gets that, that her place as a woman uh, is is really difficult for her to navigate and, and i'm curious given some of the challenges that she had at the time how do you then as a filmmaker in telling her story uh, how how much time or, or how did you make the decision and how much time to devote to her as a woman and some of the challenges that that led to for her and her career yeah that was a big and, and complicated issue for us uh um, and it took us a while to figure it out. I, I can say eventually our, our choice was driven in part um, by what she herself said about the issue. So in many occasions, she had a very mundane um, approach, I would say, or a view of her own role as a woman in, in the world of political leadership at the time. Um, and she, she was a, a, a very strong objector to feminism as a concept, um, as it was um, – you know, drafted back in the 50s and 60s, especially in America. She was very um, connected to America. And, and the, the kind of feminism that emerged in, in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s, she distanced herself from that very much um, um, in, in how she spoke about it. But I would say that she was a true feminist in, in her way of life, in, in her achievements, in the things that she was able to do. Um, so it was it was always a, a tricky subject for her as well. But... Um, I think eventually in, in several opportunities, she speaks about uh, her role as a woman and, and she says that she doesn't want to be judged as a woman. Um, she mm. doesn't want to be differentiated from the rest of, of her um, peers, the rest of her colleagues in, as world leaders or politicians at the time. And to a degree, we went with that. So we didn't emphasize the fact that she was a woman constantly throughout the film. We didn't took it as a, as a didn't take it as, a, as an angle throughout the film. We did choose to stop at certain points and address it. She also addressed it in her own autobiography. It's not that she completely ignored it. Um, and it comes in the film in several contexts, but um, but we didn't want to sort of focus on that throughout the film. Yeah, and that's certainly the case that as you watch, it, it felt to me that when, when it was brought up in, in the film, it's brought up by the interviewers or some of the writing, right? So it's not something that's being forced yeah. and that you're constantly going back to. It's being brought up because at certain points it became an issue. Yeah. Uh, so it's, and, it's and really And of course pleasant. I would say, I think that the fact that she's a woman has very much to do with the way that she's portrayed in Israel and remembered in Israel. So I, I think, right. again, with all my criticism of her, I think that she was very much overly criticized or 
were um, judged very severely, um, in part because she was a woman and people were not used to seeing women in, in such positions of power. Um, and, and she was, I think, sort of encouraged to, um, through her portrayal in the media and, and through the criticism that she faced even when she was alive, she was, I think, somehow pushed to being you know, stronger than the rest of the men. She had to prove so much that she was able to be a leader um, that she took on a very typically, you know, stereotypical male um, role or behavior. And, yeah. and, and of course, then she was also judged for that. So, and I think it's very classic for the time. You can see the same with Thatcher in, in the UK and in, with many other of the first female leaders across the world. Um, so it's not only her, but it's, it's very typical. Right, it's it's that old thing of for a woman a woman you have to be twice as good to be considered half as good uh, as men. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's one of it's one of those uh, one of those double standards that exist. For people going to see this film now, as it's as it's coming to Canada, making its theatrical run starting in January, I, I assume that anyone coming to this film would have some expectation or some idea that Golda Meir's story still influences contemporary politics and, and the peace movement in the Middle East today, uh, as people are coming to the film, should they expect to take away something to help them situate the situation in Israel today? And was that your intent? I think so. Intent? I think, yeah, it definitely was. I think uh, when we started this project, we knew very little about those, even though we, we live in Israel and we grew up here, we knew very little about those five years between 1969 and 1974, and I cannot underestimate the importance of these five years, um, as I found out in the process. Basically, every conflict that defines our lives in the Middle East, and that, of course, has a, a very big outreach to the rest of the world, um, basically every one of these conflicts has either um, was either born or, um, or culminated during those four years. It's just two years after Israel occupied the West Bank, um, social tensions are, are at a peak in Israel in a way that will change the, the politics of the nation f until today, basically. Um, two regional wars, a, a big bundle of issues that, that still dominate our life today were really at their peak at the time. And, and it was a very crucial, I think, decision time, especially for um, for the region in general, but especially for Israel, um, again, given the, the issue of the occupied uh, Palestinian territories, um, that was her, her uh, leadership time, her primary was basically the last chance, I would say, to change the reality that, that uh, came after the, the occupation of the West Bank. Um, and it was, it was a big question in Israel, and Golda determined or was part of determining the answer to that question, the consequences of which we still face today, um, which is, of course, the, of course, the first settlements and the decision to hold the territories as a, um, rather than look for any possible way to resolve the conflict. Right. And do you think that because it's still so prominent, that has uh, well, you mentioned at the start that you know people in Israel had a, had a reaction uh, of to this different from what you saw in the United States. Uh, you know, is, is it possible for audiences to come in, uh, sort of? I mean, someone like me who who doesn't know a lot about Golda Meir, you know, I'm coming in basically new to the entire story. But but people who know, uh, as you said, is it possible for anyone to come in with this into this without a strong perspective before? And can you? Is there space to change that for for those who know this story well already? Um, yeah, a lot of people come very uh, strong-minded towards Golda yeah. before they walk into the film. I, I think in many cases we saw a very big shift. Um, of course, it depends on the audience and the context, but uh, I would say generally we got a response from um, especially Jewish people in America who know her very well, and she's a very big icon, especially with the Jewish community there. Um, many of them um, you know, reported or commented on the film that um, there is a more layered or more complex view of her now rather than this, this sort of glorifying, um, unified approach of the big mother. Um, something a little bit more complex than that, um, at least. And um, and in Israel, the other way around. Uh, again, a lot of people said that um, there's some kind of empathy towards her, uh, which we always feel is is a, is a good outcome. Um, I, I can tell one small story about that, which is um, 
about the Black Panthers movement. Uh, there's a chapter in the film about yeah. the Israeli Black Panthers movement, which not many people abroad know about, but it was a big issue in the early 70s in Israel. Um, and Golda was sort of at the center of their protest, and, and she had a big conflict with them. And uh, Ruven Abargil, who is one of the leaders of the Black Panthers, who, as a result of the protest, set several years of his life um, in, in jail, um, so someone who had a big clash with her and suffered very severe consequences. Um, he wrote an article, and he's interviewed in the film, he wrote an article um, after watching the film at the premiere in Tel Aviv and um, said that he doesn't agree with her and that, that she did a lot of bad things, but um, that he did see a more human side of her. And above all, above all that after 40 years of resenting her, um, it's not about forgiveness, but um, but he feels more empathy towards her, and he was able to release some of his anger. Um, wow. And this kind of shift was really, I think that was the most moving um, reaction we got to this film. Um, again, not because I think leaders uh, in general, or Golda specifically, should be revered, or, you know, there are public figures that they influence the lives and deaths of, of thousands of people, and they deserve all the scrutiny in the world. Um, but we always have something to, to, to gain from empathy. It's always a good thing to, to be more empathic and to see things in a more complex way. Yeah, it's definitely something that we could use more of in this world. And as you said, it comes through very clearly in the film. So definitely encourage everybody to go see it. Uh, and Udi Nir, thank you for taking the time today. And congratulations on a wonderful film. Thank you very much for this talk. So there you have it. My conversation with Udi Nir. One of the directors of Gold, as I said on the show, really enjoyed it. It's a, a very well put together film. It's creative and clever, and it walks the line of having a perspective but not hitting you over the head with it really, really well. So if you are in Toronto, it is starting its theatrical run on January the 3rd at the Ted Rogers Hot Docs Cinema. So definitely check that one out if you can. Really enjoyed it. Love learning about stories that I don't know much about. And there's certainly this film is a great example of that. So again, January 3rd, 2020 at the Hot Docs Ted Rogers Cinema starting its theatrical run. So that's it for the show for 2019 been a fun year always happy to learn about new things talk to people about their projects there's so much cool stuff happening in the world of history and it's, it's fun to be able to explore that and, and talk with folks about what's going on in the field and thanks to everybody out there for listening you know you keep the show going with your subscriptions your comments your ratings all that good stuff and i'm so appreciative of it you know, we started the show seven and a half years ago. We've been doing this for, uh, in podcast terms, a really long time. Uh, but yeah, seven and a half years of the History Slam, and it's it's all possible because of you folks out there. And I'm so appreciative that you provide me the opportunity to, uh, you know, provide some content, uh, hopefully some enjoyable content, shine some lights on some new topics. And I'm very appreciative that folks keep coming back or people find us for the first time. Uh, however it is you find us, I'm so appreciative. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful end to 2019. Whatever you're getting up to, uh, hopefully there's some opportunities to relax, have uh, some nice festivities. Whatever you're doing, though, of course, do it safely. And don't forget, while the podcast is done for 2019, I'm not quite done for 2019 yet. Check out Active History on Friday, December the 20th, where the man, the myth, the legend, Aaron Boys and I will be back for our, I think, seventh annual year in review 100 years later. This year, of course, we are going to be reviewing 1919 and talking about all the major events of 1919. Now that we have 100 years of perspective we can actually look at what was, in fact, the most important thing of that year. That's always a lot of fun. So that's going to be coming your way on Friday, December the 20th. And, you know, if you're, if you're relatively new to the show or, or completely new to the show, head back 
to some of the archives. You know, we've done 141 of these things now. So there's a lot of content that you can go back to. A lot of it is pretty evergreen. So certainly if there's something that strikes your fancy there in the archives, I uh, would love it for you to, to check it out. So that's going to be it for me. As always, please do subscribe to the show, Apple, Google, wherever it is you get the shows, the likes, the ratings. As I say, that's the stuff that keeps the show going, allows other people to find it, and just continues to allow the show to grow. And so I'm very appreciative for anybody who does those things. That is really the core of it. If you like the show, that is you know, the best thing that you can do to help us out. So please do that. If you have an opportunity, you can, as always, find me on Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. You can email the show history slam at gmail.com. Check out active history over the break as well. We're going to be doing some reposts of some of our favorite things of 2019 and a lot of great stuff coming at you in 2020, which is when the history slam will be back in January. So, We're looking forward to that. But in the meantime, Happy New Year, everybody. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.